Hello brothers and sisters of Christ, we're going to get to the part three and we're going to try to get through this pretty quick, but um, I might do it in two parts, it might be one, but lately every part we've done in this series of salvation for saved sinners and it's going to be part three, the lust of other things, and we're going to try to get through it. So 2 Timothy 3.16, remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished into all good works. That's why you study, brothers and Christ. You study so that these things don't get in the way. When the world tries to throw stuff at you, get you to sin, to try to distract you with commandment, the three things in this, uh, this series of studies was cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things. And they come in and they get in the way and they affect your walk with the Lord. They affect your fellowship with the brethren. If you're a young man or an old man like me, old man in ministry, it can affect your ability to be used in the ministry. So it's very serious okay, that you study to show thyself approved. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctified for that truth, that word is truth. We learn that true love for Jesus Christ is keeping, is doing your best to keep His word. It's not a feeling that you have inside. It's not flesh. It's your actions, your choice to choose to obey the word of God because you're truly saved and born again, new creature in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, "If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him." Okay, Jesus said, there's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. How would you know his commands if you don't study them? How do you know what God's word is if you don't study? How did I come to the true saving plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you? I started looking into the Bible version issue and realized I was lied to by a lot of people. Okay. Truth. Once you have truth, once you've got truth in your hands, we're going to use my big Bible today <laughs> with the large print. Once you've got the truth of God in your hands, then God can start working with you. Then I learned the true plan of salvation, true biblical repentance, godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him. Understanding the reason you're sorry for Him is twofold, because you've sinned against a God, all right, almighty, righteous God that's going to judge you one day, and the punishment of that sin is hell. Eternally separation from God and hell and then a lake of fire. You come to God broken. I was never taught this being a fake Christian growing up in these Babel buildings. I was never taught that. I was taught repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. Now continue in your sin and have fun. Continue in your sin and have fun. I was never taught what true biblical repentance is. And you won't find true biblical repentance in the Bible perversions out there. You only find in the King James Bible. The only proper plan of salvation you only find in the King James Bible. That's why you're to study after you get saved. But I learned the Bible version issue. I came to the true plan of salvation. The belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that it was God manifest in the flesh. I believe this. That's the salvation that was preached to me. God was manifest in the flesh. It was God's blood that was, that was uh, spilled on Calvary on the cross. He died to pay for my sins. Afterwards, I confess both in prayer, and I ask God to save me. Call upon the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. Call does not mean believe. Call means actually call. Now here's the thing. What they'll try to get you, brother and sister Christ, with call, is they'll try to tell you, well, what if someone can't speak? They're mute. Okay? It's down here. I confessed my sins. As a sinner, come to God as a broken sinner, have confess my sorrow for my personal sins against Him down here. You don't have to have a volume come out of your mouth to pray to God. You can bow your head and it's all quiet and you're praying to God in your heart. It's always a heart issue, not a head issue. The head issue is what sends a lot of people to hell. It's a heart issue that sends a lot of people to heaven, Jesus Christ. Okay, it's got to make it down here. Okay? You confess both your, your repentance and your belief in prayer. And then you ask God to save you to prove that you don't deserve it. You don't deserve to be saved. 
Okay. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't earn. You don't earn it. There's nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Now after salvation, you've been shown the perfect written word of God. It's time to study to show thyself approved. Okay. Uh, uh, that the man of God may be perfect through all, furnished unto all good works. And that's when we start, I quote those scriptures about, uh, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You start coming across instructions, commands, holy commands of God. Save from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Be sober. Be vigilant. Don't be drunken. And we're going to get a lot, we're going to go through a lot of the lust of the flesh today when we talk about, um, Salvation for saved sinners, lust of other things. Uh, Philippians 2.12 reads, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. What's the salvation being talked about here? As we said in the other two parts, it's talking about salvation in this life. Not eternal salvation. Salvation in this life as a Christian. How good you're going to do as a Christian. Talking about the rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. How many rewards are you going to get? Is Jesus going to come back someday and find you falling flat on your face? Or is he going to come back finding you standing in an upright position? Well done, thou good and faithful one. Standing. The Bible keeps saying, stand, stand, stand. Don't faint. Don't falter. Okay. That's what it means by working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And if you read it, once again, the whole chapter 4 talks about answering to Jesus, that everyone will have to answer to Jesus Christ. Everyone will. Saved and lost. Okay, that's the biggest thing about, just real quick, not, not a big side note, but liberty. Liberty says that if I sin, true liberty for a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, and some of the brethren are messing this up in their teachings, true liberty for a Bible-believing, God-fearing man what it plainly says is you've been liberated from the law of sin and death. You've been liberated from a, the consequences of a law. The law of sin and death. Death is the consequence. Hell and the lake of fire is the consequence for sinning against God. We've been liberated from the death part. And Paul talks about how the law of sin. He still has to deal with the law of sin. Brother and sister Christ, we all have to deal with the law of sin. But then they try to say, well, we can sin so that grace may abound. We can just sin all we want because just put it under the cross, which we'll be talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Before that, it talks about, before Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, before that, uh, two, chapter 2, verse 12, before that, it talks about how everyone's going to have to answer to Jesus Christ, including saved sinners. Everyone will have to answer. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. So then, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every one of us. No exceptions. Do you still want to keep sinning that grace may abound? When you find out that you have to actually answer for your life as a Christian down here at the judgment seat of Christ? Uh, no, you don't want to keep sinning that grace may abound. Romans 14, 11, it reads in Romans 14, 11, For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to God, so that everyone shall give an account of himself to God. There's the address, Romans 14, 11. I have a hard time with addresses, but I love the Word of God. And I'm going to work on that a little bit more. But 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one receiveth the things done in his body, according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Okay? You're going to be judged on your good works and your bad works. What's the bad work? Getting drunk. What's the bad work? Playing video games. Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games. Okay, and so on and so forth. Bottom line, sin. What's bad works? Sin. What's a reprobate work? Well, that's a whole other study, but I believe reprobate work is when you have a false Christian doing good works that line up with Scripture, but they're reprobate. In other words, they're worthless because they're not going to the judgment seat of Christ to get to get rewards. They're going to try to have to. They're going to have to stand before Jesus Christ at the great white throne and say, "Look at all these good works we've done according to the Scriptures." But the reprobate, one sin sends you to hell. They're still under the law of sin and death. 
that word death didn't get dropped because they never got saved and got born again. They still they chose the world, their sins, over the Lord Jesus Christ. And I always like to point this out. What you receive and what you lose at the judgment seat of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, is on you. That's why it says work out your own salvation. That's why it says it's your salvation. Because you're the one that's got to answer for that salvation at the judgment seat of Christ. Your life as a Christian. And what you gain and what you lose is on you. It's not my fault. It's not someone else's fault. It's not the world's fault. Oh, it's my flesh's fault. Now, we have to deal with this wicked flesh. and It's going to tempt us. But when you give in to temptation and you choose to sin and start earning bad works, where it says we have to answer for the good and the bad, that's on you. We say, well, what's your answer when we do stuff that's bad? What does the Bible say? If any, this is Jesus Christ. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily. He knows we're going to sin. Pick up your cross daily and get back to following Jesus Christ. And follow me is what Jesus said. Get back to following Jesus Christ. You fail the Lord. You fall into sin and temp you fall into temptation and choose to sin. You let the Lord down. You let the brethren down. If you're in ministry, it lets the brethren down because it'll affect your, affect your ability and usefulness in the ministry. Maybe you've, that part of that sin is you've wronged a brethren. You need to repent. You need to ask God for forgiveness first. And if you've offended a brother in Christ, you need to ask His forgiveness. Amen. Mark 4.18. This is the verse God put in my heart. I was reading it. Now understand, once again, this is for instruction in righteousness. Doctrinally, it's talking about lost people. These are three reasons why the lost people of this world will reject Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. So they can have this world. Cares of this world come in and prevent them. They, I don't care more about what other people think. My standing, my mo money, it gets into deceitful of riches and lust of the flesh. You mean I have to give up sin as a Christian? I have to have a changed life? I have to be a new creature in Christ Jesus? Well, that's not what I want. And they get preached this easy believism, false gospel of you can just believe in your head, just believe, and continue living in your sin and living any way you want. You can be as God's knowing good and evil. You can decide what's good or not. You can decide what's sin or not. This, this book here, ah, oh, it's just a guideline. That's, oh, that's more appealing to people. And that's what they go for. But remember, instruction righteousness for a Christian, these are the same three things that prevent people from getting saved. These are the same three things that are going to try to crawl back into your life as a Christian to try to pull you down and make this book right here less fruitful in your life. Let's read it, Mark 4.18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, cares of this world, we already talked about that, and the deceitfulness of riches. And here we're on part three. And the lusts of other things enter in. What do these three things do? What's the main purpose of these three things? In other words, these three things are enemies. They're infiltrating and they're trying to do something. They're trying to do some damage. But what's the damage that these things do? They choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. You have a tree that looks alive, looks healthy, but there's no fruit. Okay, it's a great verse you can use for false converts. It's a great verse you use for, like I said, but doctrinally it's talking about, I believe, false converts in the lost world. Good, beautiful, healthy tree, but where's the fruit? You come to it looking for fruit. And if a tree doesn't give fruit, what do you do? Well, if it hasn't given fruit for two to three years, you don't waste time with it. You cut it down and throw it in the fire. And you plant a tree that will grow fruit. Okay. But these three things are a big motivator to get people to reject Jesus Christ. But for instruction righteousness, these three things can seriously affect the fruitfulness of a Christian. So let's get into this study, okay, about lusts of other things. All right? Before we get into the actual sin, sin, the lusts of the flesh, okay, the acts of the flesh, however you want to say it, 
So that we'll say it how the scripture says it when we get to it. You need to understand the state of a saved sinner versus the state of a lost sinner. What makes us different from the lost world? I have a professing of faith. That's what makes me different. Well, no, because the lost world has professions of faith. Well, my profession of faith is different than theirs. Well, there's a lot of professing Christians out there who profess to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but with the life they live, they deny the resurrection with the life they live. I did that study and I had a lot of the easy believism, excuse me, I had a lot of the easy believism attack me for that because I told them that you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the life that you're living. There's no changed life. The old man was never crucified with Christ. The new man was never raised. The old man is still alive and kicking and living strong, going strong. So let's talk about the state of the saved sinner. Guess what verse we're going to? <laughs> Romans chapter 8. It's the best verse for showing the distinction for the state of a saved sinner and the state of a lost sinner. Okay. Romans 8. Chapter 1. And we're going to read down to 15, chapter 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Okay? Just throw this in there real quick. That's what liberty is. There's no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. If you sin, you don't go to hell. That's the liberty there. So, brethren, if you've called someone lost because they, they have a sin issue... And it's not a salvation issue, it's a sin issue. That's what makes it a liberty issue. Okay? If they're still holding on to that sin, it's a brother in Christ. I've done studies before that say it's their justification to break fellowship with brethren because of sin. The Bible teaches, yes, if, if a brother in Christ is in wicked sin and they refuse to let go of it, you can break fellowship with them. I say can because it's like if his sin is something you don't struggle with, you keep trying to tell him, hey, you need to repent. You need to repent. After a while, that brother won't want to be around you if they choose that sin. And that's what breaks my heart, brothers and sisters of Christ. There are brethren out there that I believe are saved who have chosen sin over fellowship with the brethren. All you do is call them out on their sin. And nine out of ten times, if they're going to choose their sin over what you're preaching to them, truth, wisdom, the laws of God, that which is holy, the holy commandment, which is, you know, like abstain from all appearance of evil, put no wicked thing before thine eyes, that's considered a holy commandment because it comes from God. When Jesus said, Be ye holy as I am holy, he's talking about the commandments. Jesus obeyed all the commandments. He was perfect. Can we be perfect? No. Are we going to sin? Yes. Are we going to make mistakes? Yes. But don't fall into the trap of justifying that sin and trying to hide that sin under liberty. Okay, the Bible says that we're not supposed to use liberty for an occasion to the flesh. And I see some of the brethren doing that. Okay, true liberty for a Christian is this what we just read right there. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, what if I sin? There's no, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Well, what if I fell the Lord? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Well, what if I know a brother in Christ that's holding on to sin and won't let it go? If he's in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. If there's been a lot of change in that brother or sister of Christ's life, they love the King James Bible, they believe in all the major doctrines, and there's a life change, but there's just a certain area in their life where they're holding on to sin. How do I know this? When I was newly saved, brother and sister in Christ, I fought the Lord and held on to sin in my life. I gave up this, I, okay, that's sin, Lord, but this can't be sin. I'm going to hold on to it. And sometimes the Lord will have to chasten you to get you to let go of that sin. Sometimes you're going to ruin your relationship with some of the brethren because you choose to hold on to sin. You're going to hurt your walk with the Lord. If you did it in ignorance before you were saved, after you're saved... God's going to open your eyes and say, hey, that's sin. He still showed me sin in my life today that I look at it and go, that's been set in there like a, a sinful item, an idol. That's been set in there for the past four years. I didn't notice it, Lord. And God shows me, hey, that's wickedness. It goes. I'm just telling you right now, there's nothing 
in your life, no matter sin, no matter what you claim liberty, is worth you losing uh, fellowship with brethren. It's not worth it. Okay? True liberty is simply that. When you sin or you go against the commandment of God from the Old Testament, that's why it says holy day. Holy day means it's God commands you to keep this day and he tells you how to keep it, when to keep it, why to keep it, where to keep it, and the consequences for keeping it. What do we have liberty today? We're liberated from the consequences if we don't keep them. It still comes down to the consequences. The law of sin and death. Sorry to go off on this a little bit, but the Old Testament Levitical laws, a lot of times if you broke them, it was a law unto death. Sabbath day. What happened to men in the Old Testament that didn't keep the Sabbath day? They were stoned to death. Do you stone people to death today for not keeping the Sabbath day? No, why not? Because we have liberty. That's what liberty is. Therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the capital S Spirit. Now the first thing you're going to hear from these easy believers is, Oh, they're teaching works-based salvation. He's teaching works-based salvation. No. When you get saved, as we're going to keep reading, there's a change. What changes? You get spiritually circumcised. Your body, your soul that's attached to this wicked flesh, so when this flesh sins, it taints my soul. When I get saved, snip that spiritual circumcision. Now my soul is connected to Jesus Christ. That's He's my body. That's why we're the body of Christ. That's how we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And then the Holy Spirit comes in, and now we're spiritually alive. Before, when we were lost, we were spiritually dead. All right. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus, salvation, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. That's the contrast. If you're lost, you're under the law of sin and death. If you're saved, you're under the law of the Spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. I've talked about this before, brother and sister Christ. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He had an incorruptible body in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord was there. Jesus physically in a body that men could see was there in the Old Testament. God the Father, the soul, no man has seen Him. But you read in the Old Testament, any time that they actually see God, it's Jesus Christ. It's the body. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He had to. Why? That was the only way he could take on the sins of the world. It was the only way. Because right? here we see it right there. It says, likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, saved sinners. Who what? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the capital S Spirit. There's the contrast again from saved to lost. Lost people are f walking after the flesh. We're supposed to be walking after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Mind the things of the flesh. Sometimes your flesh gets the better of you and you sin. But you're not minding the things of the flesh. You get distracted by the flesh. You give in to temptation. You fail the Lord. We've all done it, brothers and sisters Christ. But this is talking about they mind the things of the flesh and they're walking after the flesh. There's no struggle there, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later in this study, about how the spirit warth against the flesh and the flesh warth against the spirit. This is saying that there's no, there's no war going on. Right? But they that are after the Spirit do the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. If you haven't watched my studies, brothers and sisters of Christ, go watch my studies on can a Christian be carnally minded and walking after the flesh. Right there just gave you the answer. The answer is no. Because to be carnally minded is death. That means you're still under the law of sin and death if you're carnally minded. When you get saved, your heartfelt conviction of sorrow for sin that you sinned against God, that repentance that you had, is going to lead to a changed life after salvation. Now you're going to say, God, clean up my life. You're no longer going to be carnally minded. That's the old man. The new man's not carnally minded. The new man is spiritually minded. 
For, the, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. You can't be a Christian and be the enemy of God. That's what it means by it says enmity against God. You cannot be an enemy of God and be a Christian. Okay? There's no such thing as a carnal Christian. But I did any more in-depth study on the series of Can a Christian Be Carnally Minded? For is not subject to the law of God. Law of God is another way of saying the law of life, the spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? It's not subject to the law. It's not subject to true biblical salvation. Why? Because you didn't repent. It's just head belief. And 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 to say that you cannot, or that says that you can believe in vain. And you read that whole chapter, he goes in and starts saying that they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ verbally up here. But the life that they're living, they're rejecting the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the old man still being alive. So they never truly believe down here the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You leave repentance out, and you go against the changed life, the new creature in Christ Jesus afterwards, you are not saved. It's not so. Okay, enmity is against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can, indeed can be. You have to come to God broken. So God can come in and say, okay, I'm going to take over, and I'm going to clean up your life. You can't do it, but I can. And He's going to come into your life, and He's going to clean it up. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I have that marked in yellow. All this is like red for saved, brown for lost. But when I come to that verse, it's in yellow. Why is that? Because it's instruction and righteousness. That applies to both saved and lost. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't please God as a Christian. If you get into sin and you start holding on to sin... The lusts of the flesh, the lusts of other things, you cannot please God. Your walk with the Lord starts to hurt. Your prayer life, your Bible reading life, Bible study life, your fellowship life, all of it starts to come tumbling down. I speak from experience. I'm not going to call anybody else out there and point because I know whoever's watching, you guys can testify too. Your walk with the Lord comes tumbling down. Your life as a Christian starts to come tumbling down when you start letting sin back into your life. Sin that God, that God has gotten out. Okay. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. There's a Bible if. Evidence of salvation is the Holy Spirit comes into your life he opens this book to you. You have a love of the truth, but He opens this book to you, and it reflects by the life that you're living. There's a change in your life, a physical change in your life. You start being different than you used to be. You start getting sin out of your life. You start talking differently. You start thinking differently. Your priorities change from when you were lost. Your demeanor changes. Okay, and so on and so forth. Sin, God gets sin out of your life. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, and so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Why tell us that if we can't judge whether someone has the Holy Spirit in them by the life they're living? The Bible says uh, not to judge according to the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment by this book. You look at this book, and you look at that person. What's their attitude towards this book? You see sin in their life, you come in here and say, okay, that thing you're doing, it's sin. What's their attitude towards it? If they're, one, if, if they're, if they're newly saved, have grace for the, Christ, the brother in Christ that's struggling with sin. But if they're coming back all prideful, and their whole life they just look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes, and when you try to point out the things that they're doing wrong, they're messed up doctrinally, they're messed up on the plan of salvation, that's the biggest red flag. If, if, oh, I got saved off of easy believism, but now I'm a King James Bible believer. No, you're not. There's no way you could get saved off easy believism. I was a professing Christian that supposedly got saved off of easy believism. But when I came to the true plan of salvation, that's when I was born again. That's when God saved me. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. I put that in uh, yellow also. The body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. This body, even as a saved sinner, it's, it's, it's this body is dead because of sin. I'm, this fleshly body I'm still going to have to struggle with till the day I die or until Jesus Christ calls us home, which I praise any day now. Okay? But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, that's one of my passages for, uh, uh, for the Godhead, because here it is, the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus, but then Jesus said He raised Himself up, then God the Father raised Him up, if they're three separate persons, how did they raise up Jesus Christ? Okay. Uh, no, they're one and the same person, only one person. It's body, soul, and spirit. That raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. I might be getting ahead of myself. Yeah, I'll hold off. I've got to say the, the Paul read about, uh, are we supposed to sin that grace may abound? Okay, Not to, to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's in yellow also. Why? Because that applies to both saved and lost. You can really mess up this, this body right here. I wish I had taken care of it better. I really do. Well, these days i got to do a, just a prayer request video on some of the physical problems I'm having with my health just to get some prayer requests. But if you've, all the sin that I've lived with most of my life as a professing Christian and the damage I've done to this body because of sin, if you live after the sin of flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the capitalist spirit, I put that in red because this shows the changed life. What happened before it didn't bother me, but now what happens? Do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. God's helped me get in better health. I'm eating right. Sometimes I don't. <laughs> Anytime I go back to trying to eat where it's the wrong types of food, like poison food, my body can't handle it now because God has helped me eat healthy food for so long. You go back to trying to eat unhealthy and your body just goes, Ugh, and you just get all, my stomach hurts, um, and I'm just miserable. Okay? But do mortify the deeds of the, of the, the body, ye shall live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Okay, you don't get saved and then, oh, my flesh is still in charge. It doesn't work that way. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Oh, my flesh is in charge and, and everything. Also, the fear there is you're not supposed to be in the uh, quench the Holy Spirit. Quench not the Holy Spirit without... For which thou art, art sealed into the day of redemption. I hope I said it right. You quench the spirit because you live in fear because you're just so fleshly. You start doubting your salvation. Okay. You start fearing the flesh instead of trusting, fearing God, and trusting the Holy Spirit. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Okay. Romans uh, 6 1 says, this is where we read by for Paul, where he's saying, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How the how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? The old man is dead and buried. Therefore we are buried with him. And baptism into death, Holy Ghost baptism. Okay, water baptism is just an outward showing; doesn't do anything for you. It's an outward showing, but it's the Holy Spirit baptized by the Holy Spirit that it's talking about. Baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You're supposed to be spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. What did it say there? 
For if ye shall live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage. What did we just read there? Henceforth we should not serve sin. You're not in bondage to the flesh anymore. The flesh isn't in charge when you get saved. There's supposed to be a difference. Okay? Save state. Lost state. Lost state, your carnally mind walking after the flesh. No convictions. You try to justify sin all the time. You look like the world. Basically, you've chosen the ways of the world, and the ways of the world is sin. Okay? I've come across brethren, false brethren out there, that they'll say the right things, but their life doesn't line up with the Word of God. And when you back them in the corner about the life that they're living and say, wait a minute, that life you're living, it doesn't line up with the scriptures. Guess what happens? They turn their back on the scriptures. Every time. Every time. Right? Why? Because they're carnally minded. They were a fake and a fraud. Romans 7, 7. Okay. Stay I wasn't supposed to read that far, I guess. We read through the whole thing. But go back to Romans 7, 7 on that same chapter, okay, where it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Oh no, we're in 8. Yeah, so turn to 7, 7. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. Please forgive me, brothers and sisters Christ. Romans 7, chapter 7, verse 7. It says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. Notice chapter 7 comes before 8. This is Paul talking about his struggle with sin as a lost man versus his struggle with sin now that he's saved. This is a transition, I believe, from lost to saved. Okay? But what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known the sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust. What's the, what are we talking about for this study? The lust of other things. I would not have known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Hmm. You have to turn there, but Psalms 40, verse 8, Psalms chapter 40, verse 8, says, I delight to do the will, I'm sorry, I, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, the law is within my heart. That's what a saved sinner changes, I want to do your will, Lord. Romans 2, 14, we read, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In other words, God's laws are written on every man's heart. What is Paul saying here? Law had said that thou shalt not covet. As we get in here further, it's because it's saying that the laws are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And now that we're saved, God comes in and saves us, we have a changed life. We have a love of God's law. The holy laws. His commandments. I'm sorry, holy commandments. We have a love of God's commands. We have a love of God's word. He tells us what we're supposed to believe, our foundation, how we're supposed to live our life, how we're supposed to speak. He even gives us words to speak. When we think we don't, we don't have good words, we don't know what to say, God will tell you what to say. What to say. All right. Romans 7, 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manners of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Um, once again, i got to read number 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What's this talking about? When you're born in sin, and you're born into this world, you're in the, it's called the, we call it the age of accountability, but you're innocent. There comes a time where you're born that you're considered innocent. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. Okay? Romans 4.15 we read, Because the law worketh wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Okay? That's why Paul's saying that when I was born, there was a time where I wasn't held accountable to the law because I was innocent. Okay? But when he came, got to the age of accountability, the law revived and he died. Verse 10, And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. 
For sin taken occasion by the commandments deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. So here we have the laws holy, holy laws, and we have the commandments holy, holy commandments of God. Okay. Was then that was then that which is good made death unto me, question mark, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Remember the story, that, uh, the parable that Jesus taught about, he asked the man that you have someone who was in debt for 50, and you had someone who was in debt for like 500, and then he frankly forgave them both. It wasn't a parable. It was he was talking to a Pharisee or a publican that he was in their house. So he's, the lady comes in. She's crying. She's washing his feet with tears. And he asks him, "Who would he? Who would love him most?" And he says, "The one who forgave him most." Okay. When you were lost, the more with, sinful and wicked you start, God started opening your eyes because the law is written in every man's heart. When He started opening your eyes to show you how wicked and sinful you were. I've heard testimonies of people who are, are wicked and sinful. I'm the chiefest of sinners. When God started opening my eyes, I thought I wasn't that bad of a guy. I, was, I tried to be a nice guy, a good person here and there. I was very wicked as a lost sinner. And that helped the laws of God point me to Jesus Christ. Remember, as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Romans 8, 5, we read, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things that are after the Spirit. For the carnally minded, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's what the laws are all about, to let you know that I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. I've sinned against God, Almighty God, righteous judge, my creator, and he's going to judge me one day, and I'm going to be found guilty, and I'm going to go to hell, to burn. That's what the laws are for. That's why the laws are a good thing. They're not a bad thing just because they point out your sin. And, and the same point, when you get saved, when you have a brother in Christ, point out your sins with Scripture. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to help you get back on the right track so your walk with the Lord can be strong again, so your fellowship with the brethren can be strong again, so your ministry can be strong again. When someone goes to correct you, okay? For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now Galatians 3.24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to, unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. How many brothers and sisters out there have testimonies where when they start, God started opening their eyes to sin, the laws our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, start opening their eyes to sin, that they tried to do good on their own without Jesus Christ. I'm going to try to do. Sometimes I could succeed and do good morally, but overall, my life was still wicked. I tried to do good. I tried to clean up my life first before I got saved. And it's just a complete mess. Look at Paul, what he's talking about with the complete mess. Verse 17, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 18, For I know that it is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. People say, well, he's talking about a saved life. When you're saved and you're doing wrong, God will bring some a sin, God will bring someone into your life to point you in the right direction on how to get that sin out of your life. To point you in the right direction to know that what you're doing is wrong, this is how you're supposed to be doing it. So when he says, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. As a saved sinner, you can find it. You've got the Holy Spirit of God in you. This is if you try to clean up your life before you get saved. 19. For the good that I would do, I do not. 
You're always going to fall without Jesus Christ, without the Holy Spirit in you, and that new creature in Christ Jesus, you're always going to fail. We still fail as Christians. I mean, honestly, we still fail as Christians. Think about it. But you're trying to do it without Jesus Christ, without salvation? For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Okay? Here, I'll stop there and I'm just going to say this. I said this in my testimony on how I came to Jesus Christ. But when I was lost, one of the things that I did, and even as a lost man, I knew it was wrong by how I was raised on good morals and the uh, false Christianity, that I was addicted to porn. And I knew it was wrong. And I kept telling myself, I'm not going to do this anymore. You know who gave me victory over porn? Jesus Christ. I couldn't get victory over it when I was lost. But I tried. Verse 20. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now when it says in verse uh, Romans 7, 17, but sin that dwelleth in me, John 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Okay? It's sin that dwelleth in me. That's why I'm saying I believe this is Paul talking about a change life. He's talking about his struggles with sin and how he came to the realization that the laws are a good thing. They're a schoolmaster of Jesus Christ. It let me know how much of a wicked sinner I was and how I couldn't do right on my own. I can't do good on my own. Mm -hmm. How to perform that which is good I find not. And then I was bring it, well, Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When you get saved, you do know how to do with that which is good. Okay? I got ahead of my notes and I'm reading. <laughs> you do know how to do what is good. You hide God's word in your heart that you might not sin against them. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Howbeit when the, he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. John 16, 13. You know how to do that which is good. Seven nineteen, Romans seven nineteen, for the good that I would do I do not. We're gonna reread it because I got ahead of my notes. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Verse twenty. Now if I do that which is I would not, is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse twenty one is where we left off. We're gonna turn the page. Okay. Now we're gonna see the saved state. Here it is. Now here's the saved state. I find then a law. When I would do good, evil is present with me. Repentance. The law is there. The law, I would do good, evil is present with me. Here it is, verse 22. For I delight in the law. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. After the inward man. Verse 23. But I see another law in my members. Another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Notice the word death isn't there. We read in verse 8, the law of sin and death is what we are liberated from. That's why we use the word liberty. Death is no longer there. The consequences of sin is used to, before you're saved is hell and the lake of fire. Now that you are saved, the consequences of sin is you're going to have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ and you're going to mess out on some rewards. It's going to hurt. Sin's going to hurt your walk with the Lord, your fellowship with the brethren, your ability to be useful in the ministry, the fruitfulness of Scripture for this study. But you're not going to go to hell anymore. Death has been dropped, so now it's just the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Salvation. Now, don't get me wrong, we still have to deal with this body, but hear what he's saying here. Salvation. How do you know? Verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I may serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Okay? 
It's all about keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. And when you take your eyes off Jesus Christ and put it on the flesh, that's when the law of sin comes in. It's starting to get hot in here. <laughs> but it was cold. But then I turned on all these lights. Okay? That's the saved state. But I had to bring that in because, brother, sister, in Christ, Paul knew that you're still going to be a sinner after salvation. We're going to struggle with sin till the day we die. But the safe state of a man is carly minded walking after the flesh versus um, spiritually minded walking after the spirit. That's the contrast. We love the Holy Spirit. We love the Word of God. We love Jesus. We want to, our heart's heartfelt desire is to please God. Sin doesn't please God. Remember we read, sin is enmity against God. Flesh. That they are in the flesh cannot please God. Our heartfelt desire is to please God. So we've got to keep our flesh down. Okay. Turn to Galatians 5.13. I just wanted to really, I know I've talked about this in other studies, but I really wanted to go over it again with you, brother, sister, Christ, the importance that Paul puts on it. He goes about his changed life, and then from uh, chapter 7, he goes into chapter 8 in Romans to start explaining the difference now. He just explained the struggle, going from lost to saved, and now he goes into verse 8 and goes and talks about, here's the difference now. My old life, I was carnally minded, walking after the flesh. My new life, I'm spiritually minded, walking after the spirit, and I have to keep putting the flesh down. But I'm still under the law of sin, not the law of sin and death, but the law of sin, and i got to keep this flesh down. But that's the life of a Christian, putting the flesh down and being spiritually minded, walking after the spirit. That's the life of a Christian. And that's the number one reason why a lot of people don't get saved. I mean, you have cares of this world that might come in. You have deceitfulness of riches that might come into play sometimes. But the number one, like 90% of the reason why the majority of these, we have false Christians, false converts, and just flat out Christ rejecting sinners, is because they don't want to live a life of Christ. That life of putting the flesh down. That changed life. They love their flesh. They love sin. Galatians 5.13 For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. This is Paul saying, hey, you've got liberty in the sense that you're not going to lose your salvation if you sin against God. I used to say you can sin. No, it's when you sin. Because when you say you can, it's almost like you're making it okay. It's not okay to sin. So when you do sin and fail the Lord, you're not to use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. I've seen so many people, these false converts, these easy believism, they try to use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. When you back them in a corner with their sin, and you try to treat them like a brother or sister in Christ, and you back them in the corner with their sin, guess what they run to? They run to the cross. But, but, but I'm not saved by works. Oh, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. You're not talking about a past sin. You're coming to them with a present tense sin that they're sinning and saying, hey, you need to get that out of your life. You're sinning against God. You're not pleasing God. And what do they do? They run to the cross. Oh, you're, you're a liberty thief. And so on and so forth. Okay? That's one of the big red flags to me is when you call someone out on their sin, if they always run, I've come across these people, brother and sister Christ, that they just run to the cross. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. I just put it, you know, like you have a credit card for sin, and you just keep charging it to the cross. Oh, just charge it to the cross. Oh, who cares? Just charge it to the cross. Paul comes here and says, uh, no, even though if you're truly saved and born again, you won't live like that. Remember what it said? Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But Paul comes and tries to warn people that when you sin, you are supposed to feel bad. There's supposed to be conviction there to help motivate you to get it out of your life. You're supposed to be miserable when you sin. The number one reason why you're miserable as a Christian, if you are brothers and sisters in Christ out there, whether you're a man in ministry, or just men and women, brothers and sisters in Christ, the reason you're miserable is because you have sin in your life that you're holding on to and you won't let it go. And it's affecting your, fellowship, your uh, walk with the Lord, your fellowship with the brethren, and if you're in ministry, it affects your ability, usefulness in the ministry. That's why you're miserable. Paul says you're not to use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. 
but by love serve one another. You're not serving one another if you're justifying sin because then you're promoting that same sin in other people. You're not uh, loving one another when you might not be promoting that sin, but you're not doing anything about it. And maybe the sin that you have, that you're, that you're holding on to, someone else gave up and you're tempting them to get back into it. It's not loving one another. Verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Bible talks about casting pearls before swine. You know what that's talking about? When someone doesn't want wisdom, they don't want instruction, the Bible says buy the truth and sell it not, and it also talks about wisdom and instruction and something else. There's a fourth thing I keep forgetting because I'm still trying to memorize that scripture. But bottom line, if they don't want it, you just step back. That's why it says, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Don't fall into the trap of debating and backbiting and getting bitterness in your heart towards the brethren. You point out their sin. If they don't want to give it up, give them to God. It's between them and God now. If it starts to really affect your fellowship, you put them out of your fellowship and say, hey, God will judge those that are without. Okay. God, you deal with them. I tried preaching truth to him. He doesn't want it. Be consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Try to see where we're going to read down to. 18. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We're not carnally minded walking after the flesh. We're spiritually minded walking after the Spirit. But there's times that you can take your eyes off Jesus Christ and put it on this world and on this flesh. And you start to stumble and you start falling and you start falling into the lust of the flesh. Okay? Walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. They're contrary one to another. In other words, if you're, walk, if you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you're not walking in the Spirit. That Holy Spirit's telling you, don't do that, don't do it. And you had to tell the Holy Spirit, you need to go to the other room for a moment because I want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. How many people can testify that they've done that as a brother and sister of Christ? Known people who've done it. They have testimonies. Okay? When I got newly saved, I did that a lot. I was like, oh, come on, Lord, this isn't really that bad of sin. I'm going to go ahead and keep this. And the Holy Spirit was I was like, I don't want to hear it. I want to keep this sin. And God had to really work on me to pry some of those sins out of my hands through chastisement, through bad times. Okay? It's so easy to blame the enemy when this is the number one person who's responsible. It's easy to say that I'm under spiritual attacks when this is the number one person that's responsible. I'm holding on to something and, and I'm just not letting go. And God has to bring hard times my way. He's got to chastise me to get me to let go of that sin. To get me to go the direction He wants me to go when I'm trying to go a different direction. Okay? Walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other. Brother, sister Christ, right there. There's supposed to be a battle between the flesh and the spirit. There's going to be a battle there till the day you die. Or until God catches us up. Okay? They're contrary one to another. So that, that, that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit... Ye are not under the law of sin and death. You say you added that, because that's the law that you're not under. We're still under the law of sin, remember? But we're just not under the law of sin and death. If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Another way you can look at that too is to say, what it, well, what it's saying is, is if you're spiritually minded and you're going gung-ho for the Holy Spirit and cleaning up your life and getting stuff, you won't fall into the trap of the law of sin. That could also be there. Okay. 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Lust of other things. They come in, the lust and the sins of this world. You let any of them back in, it's going to affect your fruit, this fruitfulness of this Word of God in your life. Your walk with the Lord 
your fellowship with the brethren, and if you're a man in ministry, it's going to affect your usefulness and fruitfulness in the ministry. Let's go through it. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery and fornication. Stop there for a second. Okay, we read 19. Okay, just making sure I didn't have it. I broke them apart. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, brothers. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery and fornication. I put adultery and fornication. I didn't say and. I'm saying and in the sense that we're going to talk about these two. Adultery, fornication. In this world today, it's been taught that that something that's supposed to be between a husband and a wife, it's supposed to be precious, it's supposed to be a good thing, it's supposed to be an intimate thing between husband and wife, today it's just a commodity. You know, like going to the movie theaters, and you pay to watch the movie theaters. It's, it's nothing, that, it's out of control. Adultery is out of control, fornication is out of control. And we're going to get to this eventually, but... How do you think we got to where we are when it comes to sodomy in America? I mean, seriously, how do you think it got this far? Sexual perversion starts at fornication. Simple, simple fornication and adultery. If you don't have that solid foundation by the Holy Spirit to say, hey, this is for marriage and it's something that's intimate between a husband and a wife, that sexual perversion, what happens with perversion? It gets worse and worse and worse over time. I'm sorry, I tried to do a will. First and worse over time. And that will gets bigger and bigger, and that perversion gets bigger and bigger. And look at the world today when it comes to sexual perversion. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't know how many brethren I've talked to, brothers and sisters, I was shocked. to me I thought it was just something guys did, but evidently, once again, I, I'm naive in some areas when I was young. I'm talking about when I was newly saved. But come to find out, brothers and sisters in Christ have all got testimonies on where they struggled with porn before they got saved, and then God got it out of their life. Sexual perversion. It's a big thing in this world today. You got it out of your life. The old man's dead and buried. What happens if you try to bring it back into your life? You think it's not going to hinder your walk with the Lord? Oh, it's not that big deal. Just put it under the cross. No, it's going to hinder your walk with the Lord big time. The lust of other things come in and choke the Word and it become unfruitful. It's going to pull you away from the Word of God. Stay away from all the sexual perversions that are out there. Brothers and sisters in Christ, my home is where I live. And the last year, this home is where I live. Okay, during the winter, I had this room set up where it was the office room and my bedroom, and I'll probably move it back again this winter because it's easier to heat one room in the house the whole winter than it is to heat the whole house. And I can live off this little room that I'm sitting in right now if I had to live in a small place and give this place up for a smaller place. But the point is, is I live in this home and this property. That's where I am. I'm isolated. But I've purposely isolated myself because of how wicked this world is. You can't go into town without seeing a modestly dressed men and women. Okay, uh, Hollywood. You got to give up uh, video games, uh, Hollywood movies and TV shows, uh, commercials. Give up TV. Period. The cable TV. Give it up. Even the commercials. Everything uses sex to sell things because it appeals to the flesh. Notice the next one there, it says uncleanness. Okay. Uh, lasciviousness. All this stuff can come in, brothers and sisters in Christ. One of the things, when I, when I think of lasciviousness, I keep going back to that verse that Paul talks about where he's telling Timothy, um, mainly, if doctrinally, it's for men in ministry, you need to be content with food and raiment. But no, no, i got to have this, and I've got to have that, and i got to have a white picket fence, the dream home, and everything. No. If you want to be really effective in ministry, you've got to learn to be content with food and raiment. Paul also goes on to say that whatever state he's in, he's learned to be there with content. So there's sometimes he might have more than just food and raiment. Praise the Lord. It's a blessing from God. But he has to keep reminding himself that whatever state I'm in, I need to be there with content. I might have to go back to just food and raiment. I might have to go weeks without food. I remember Brother Brian talking about um, when he was newly married, I think it was when he was newly married, he talked about him and his wife, 
how they went weeks, I think it was week or weeks, plural, without meat. They lived very poor once. God has blessed them and got them out of it. Do they, if they have to go back there, they have to learn to be content. But he's got a great testimony on how they were content with the with the with the content with whatever state that God had him in. And there was a time where God had him in a very poor state. He's had me in a poor state before. Right. Now, not as bad as that. I, I was bad as that when I was a lost man, but as a saved man, I haven't been in that poor of a state yet. Okay, it's a testimony to warn us all, especially men in ministry, that. If times get really bad, you might have to go to just living with one set of clothing and be blessed if you get to eat every other day, maybe. It could get that hard. But when you start getting to lasciviousness, you start forgetting how to be content with food and raiment. Idolatry. I keep warning people. I found some idols in my house that were actually false gods, and God got them out. A God got them out of my life. I said, throw them away, I threw them away. I destroyed them so no one else can use them, and threw them away. Because in the Old Testament, when they had their, their false gods, they would ground them to powder and throw them in, in the river. They'd bury them. They'd try to destroy them. If they couldn't destroy them, they'd bury them. They'd try to put it somewhere where nobody else could get to them. They're false gods. But a lot of things in your life can come, become idolatry. I'm sorry, but it, it can be, brothers and sisters. When I mean by I'm sorry, it's because... Uh, trying to live your dream life can become idolatry. God's like, no, that's not what I have for you. Having that, you have your vehicle out there that you love, and you're out there just waxing it every day. What happens? It can become idolatry. You can become idolizing something that's just a, a it's just supposed to get you from point A to point B. Okay. There's a lot of things in your life that can come in and become idolatry. Video games, movies, TV shows, video. Uh, Hollywood movies and TV shows, secular style music that feeds the flesh, you can start idolizing that stuff. And once again, what happens? I'm still shocked that there's still people out there, some of them I believe are false converts, they're lost, but I believe some of them are saved, that they will idolize something in their life, in their life to the point that it's more important than fellowship with the brethren. That they would choose certain things in their life that's become idolatry, or just it's flat out sin, and they would choose that over fellowship with the brethren. Idolatry is a serious thing. You always think, well, we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Idolatry would never be a problem to me. Then why is Paul warning the Galatians about idolatry? Because idolatry can still sneak and creep its way in, brothers and sisters in Christ. Witchcraft. Anytime I see the word witchcraft, the biggest thing is, yeah, you can see the spell casting. I've played video games galore about that. That's satanic and, wi and wicked. But in this world today, what's really destroying this nation, America, and I see it destroying all the other nations too, is feminism. You say, well, it says witchcraft, not feminism. Remember what Samuel told Saul. That rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And what's feminism today? Women rebelling against God. It's witchcraft. Do you see it everywhere? It's destroyed this nation. It's destroyed the women of this nation as a whole. It's destroying the women of all the other nations as well. And we're warned about it. It's the works of the flesh. If you, and one of the biggest things, I talked to sisters in Christ, and I had a sister in Christ fall away and go back to the world. And I, I pray that she's saved. Okay, I'm not trying to doubt her salvation. That's why I said she fell away and went back to the world. But I've talked to sisters in Christ through emails, face to face, that they all say one of the biggest things that a sister in Christ is going to struggle with is feminism. It's the works of the flesh. It's not of God. Sisters in Christ out there, are you wearing modest dresses that go down to your ankles? Well, I wear skirts. No, modest dresses. Long hair. Okay, are you under the head covering of a man today? Or are you still your own head covering? Are you, do you still have your own career, my own car, my own home? My, you just have no need of a head covering. That's still promoting feminism. I understand some of you are in a position where 
because of America, the way feminism is so hardcore, you're probably kicked out and you're on your own. And you have to do a job to, to survive. I understand that. I have grace. But what's your heartfelt desire? Are you still, even though you have a job and you go to, to a place that you pay rent and you have your own vehicle, are you still focusing hardcore on practicing to be a good keeper at home? How to, go, how to cook good, wholesome foods? Or have you fallen in the trap completely of just acting like the man, the man's role, and just popping something in the microwave? The place is just trashed. I'm not saying men are always trashy, but you know what I'm saying. Okay? It's works of the flesh, and you're warned. When you, sisters in Christ, when you let feminism get back into your life, it's going to ruin your walk with the Lord. It's going to ruin fellowship with some of the brethren, if not all the brethren, but mainly the brethren, the men. Uh, but some of the women that can start seeing that uh, feminism in you, it's going to start affecting your fellowship with some of the sisters in Christ, too. But here's the thing, if you're married, it's going to destroy your marriage. If you're truly married to a Bible-believing, God-fearing man that's standing up saying, I'm the head covering, I'm supposed to take care of you, and I'm supposed to protect you, and I'm the one that's supposed to, you know, be the head covering. I'm the one that's in authority over you. You guys are going to fight to the point where you're going to destroy your marriage because you're holding on to feminism. It's not worth it. Sisters in Christ, it is not worth it. Hatred. Are we supposed to hate the lost world? No. Are we supposed to hate brothers and sisters in Christ? No. How do you love the lost world? By preaching the truth to them. If they don't want the truth, then you move on. If you have a neighbor that's rejected Jesus Christ and you find out that their water's out and they don't get any water and they're just, oh, I need water, I don't know what I'm going to do. You take them a bucket of water. No, I hate him. He rejected Jesus Christ. I hate no, you take him a bucket of water. The Bible talks about how you do good things even to bad people that are doing bad things to you because it heaps fires of coals on their head. In other words, it makes them their damnation whose damnation is just when they reject Jesus Christ and die in their sins. They wind up in hell. You still do good things. You're not supposed to have hatred in your heart for anybody. Hate. You're supposed to hate evil. You can have hatred in your heart for Satan and the devils. Okay? You can have your hate toward for evil. You can hate sin. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that statement, hate the sin, uh, uh, love the sinner and hate the sin. I'm just saying you don't hate the sinner. You hate the sin that they're doing, and you preach against it. And you show them God's love, and if they want God's love, you show them where to go to get it. Calvary. Okay, and they need to go there broken. Variance. Emulations. Okay. Wrath. Remember, God's the one that pours out wrath, not us. The Bible says you're not supposed to be quick to wrath in the Psalms. You have to look that up in Psalms. I'm trying to do it from memory, but it talks about how you're not supposed to be quick to judge in action. Like, in other words, you get angry in action, and you're not supposed to be quick to wrath. In other words, if someone upsets you, you don't, you're not supposed to respond by just lashing out at them physically. But how much do we see that today? I, I hardly watch the TV, I mean, go on the computer and watch the news and what's going on in the world today because all you see is people just lashing out at each other. You see hatred for God. You see hatred for one another. And they're just pouring out their wrath on each other. Road rage. Fight here. Fight there. Um, when it comes to wrath, uh, I, I had a brother in Christ show me a video and it still sticks in my head sometimes where you have these two young couples and they're... they're Taken, I, they're using snow shovels and snow in their property. It's inside the city because you can see the houses side by side like it's a neighborhood. And they're trying to pick a fight with one of their neighbors across the road. And the guy's sitting there and the, the woman's mouthing off and everything. And the Bible says a woman's supposed to have a mild and meek spirit. She's not supposed to be out there hollering with the men. And she's out there hollering with them and egging the guy on and everything. The guy walks into the house, comes out with a gun and shoots them both. And the camera is, is like a camera on a garage for like a security camera. And it's videotaping the whole thing. 
and he shoots him. He only had like two bullets and shoots them both because they're trying to run away and everything. And as he runs back in to get another gun and come out, you can hear the woman go, Oh God, oh God, help me. And before that, she was cussing and cursing and oh, just worldly. But now she's on her deathbed. And I, I'm pretty sure they caught that guy and he's doing time, life in prison. But what is that? That guy started pouring out his wrath on people. We're not supposed to do that as Christians. But it still breaks my heart that it took that for her to cry out to God. I'm not a big fan of, like I said, I'm not a big fan of deathbed confessionals. She was sorry for the consequences. If she had conviction, she wouldn't have been acting the way she did before that happened. Now, I'm not saying I wish that. I'm not saying I want that to happen to anybody. But that was a big example of someone pouring out their wrath. They lost their temper. They got sick and tired of those two cussing at him and provoking him to fight. And he was like, I guess I'm too weak or something. And he goes inside and gets guns instead. And that still sticks in me, just, just hearing that woman cry out to God. And the guy comes out and finishes the job. What is that? That's a lot of hatred and a lot of anger. That's a lot of wrath being poured out that we're seeing. And that's happening all over the United States. Probably all over the world. I'm just saying in the United States, you see it time and time again. Someone shot so-and-so. Someone got in a fight and stabbed so-and-so. And it's just wrath, wrath, wrath that each person is pouring out on each other. Okay? That's flesh. That's not the Holy Spirit. God will pour out His wrath. God will avenge us. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. We're not supposed to be falling into that. That's flesh. And you start being one of those guys that loses your temper too much, it's going to get in the way of your walk with the Lord again. Fellowship with the brethren. When you have as so much as a small disagreement, you're going to lose your temper, and you're going to just destroy your fellowship with the brethren. And if you're in ministry, there's no way you can be in ministry and lose your temper. There's a lot of false converts out there that they cuss a lot. And they lose their temper a lot. Uh, you're not going to be that effective in ministry if you're truly saved. God's going to... Ha ha my advice is you need to step down until God gets that under control in your life. All right. But you have wrath, strife. People always causing strife. The lost world's always going to be coming in to try to cause strife. You have false converts that come in to cause strife. But brothers and sisters in Christ... You that are truly saved and born again, you can cause strife too. How? By holding on to sin and trying to hide it under liberty. You can cause strife too. Okay? Brother, sister in Christ, you can also cause strife that if when you're trying to correct a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ and they don't want it, move on. Don't cause strife. Just move on. You've, you've told them the truth. You've done their part. The Lord put it on your heart to correct them using Scripture. Now it's between them and the Lord. Seditions, heresies. Can you believe heresies is also a work of the flesh? All these different heresies we hear when it, when it comes to wrong doctrines, the wrong plan of salvation. Remember what I told you? The number one reason people don't want to get saved is it means that they have to struggle with their flesh and put their flesh down. The changed life after salvation. They know that there's a change. That God comes in. He is now Lord of their life. They can't be the Lord of their life anymore. A lot of these fakes, phonies, and frauds out there that like to play. I'm playing Christian. I'm playing Christian. They want, they're still the Lord of their own life. They don't love Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. They don't love Jesus Christ at all of any Bible. They're still the Lord of their life. Because that's what this Antichrist spirit this Antichrist Jesus, this false Jesus of all these Bible perversions and all these false religions, they tell them that they can be Lord of their lives and get to go to heaven. You can figure out, you know, if I was Lord of my life trying to figure out what was right and what was wrong, my life would be a mess. Praise God that Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, is Lord of my life. He comes in and tells me what to do. What's behind all the heresies? Sin. Sin. The flesh. Every heresy you've ever heard. There's sin behind it. Men trying to be gods. You can be as gods knowing good and evil. They want to be their own Lord. Men that love the praise of men above the praise of God. Okay. Envyings. 
Be careful not to fall into envying, brother and sister in Christ, envying one another. Envying the lost world. Definitely don't envy the lost world. I have sorrow for the lost world. I feel sorry for the lost world. Don't envy these rich people. Don't envy a neighbor, because there's times that God's caught me looking at some of the neighbors, and I'm sitting here, and the Lord's got me going by with just what I have. I'm content with what I have, but every once in a while I look around, it seems like all the neighbors, they've got fishing boats, they've got campers, they got all this stuff, and I'm like, it would be nice to have one. And then, Bob, and then the Lord has to correct me and say, you know what? You're starting to fall into the trap of envying. Be content with what you have. I have my little kayak that the Lord blessed me with to go fishing on the ocean when it's calm enough for me to go fishing on the ocean. To get bottom fish. And one fishing lasts me like four or five months of fish. And you don't have to fish every day. You would if, I mean, you would if you didn't have refrigeration. I'd only go out there and catch one fish a day and eat like every other day, you know. You'd have to do that. But don't fall in the trap of envying. It's just going to get in the way of your walk with the Lord because it falls under deceitfuls of riches. Just a little bit more, Lord. Just a little bit more, Lord. A little bit more and I'll be happy. A little bit more and I'll be content, Lord. Just a little bit more. Okay, I got that little bit more. Well, you know what? Maybe just a little bit more. Then I'll be content. See how that works? Envyings, okay? Murders. Once again, pouring out your wrath. I talked about that incident. So I'm murdering somebody. Okay? You're not supposed to hate a brother in Christ. I forgot that passage, but I'm trying to think about it. But there's something about it. It's like murder. You've murdered him in your heart. Uh, angry with a brother without a cause, maybe. I can't remember. Please forgive me, brother Jesus Christ. But there's physical murder. That's obvious. Right? But be careful. Don't fall into that drunkenness. Okay, I've had close-up experience with, first of all, with me. When I was in the military, I got drunk as a lost man. Uh, that's flesh. I've had professing Christians, my ex-wife, who had a serious problem drinking, and she got drunk a lot. And she kept trying to look through the scriptures to find ways to, to justify it. And in the end, when she couldn't justify it, it's just we have liberty. It's under the cross. I'm not saved by works. I've had to deal with drunkenness, hardcore drunkenness up close. I was in the military. A lot of times, for the most part, when I first started, I didn't want anything to do with alcohol. My first four years I was stationed in North Dakota, I was the designated driver. And I'm not trying to go into details, but I was a designated driver for the guys that wanted to go to those bars that they're hooting and hollering and they're getting drunk, and I would be sitting in the back playing blackjack, drinking sodas because I'm the designated driver, and I'd have to drive all those guys home. I've seen drunkenness. Today, I would be appalled if I ever did that today. I'm still appalled that I ever did it back then, but you understand what I'm saying about today. Definitely today. Okay? I've seen drunkenness. It, that destroys people's lives, period. What does the Bible say? If you live by the flesh, ye shall die. Drunkenness not only destroys your health, it destroys your relationships. If you're saved, it's going to destroy your relationship with the Lord. It's going to destroy your uh, fellowship with the brethren. And if you're a man in ministry, it will destroy your usefulness and ability to be used in the ministry. You're going to lose your testimony with a lot of the brethren, and you're just going to make a mockery of the Word of God. The Bible says, and it's not just drunkenness, physical drunkenness, what about spiritual drunkenness? The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary the devil goes about like a roaring lion, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You can get drunk on, the, on, on just being distracted with sin and cares of this world, Deceitful as rich, you can get drunk off of you know the flesh and get so focused on the flesh, Satan can come around and devour you. And what I mean by that is he can mess you up as a Christian. Even worse. You need to be sober physically and spiritually. Okay. Well, these days we'll probably do the study of all the different evil spirits that, that the Bible talks about. 
One of the spirits, uh, a lying spirit, and there's some other spirits. Okay? You don't want those spirits, you don't get drunk. I mean, my experience with drunkenness, it was like the person was demon-possessed. Especially drugs. Getting high on drugs. Their eyes, you look there, it's like nobody was home. They were still walking around, but their eyes were like there was nobody home. Brother Brian does a great teaching, uh, Devil Possession in the Eyes, Part 1 and 2. I suggest, it's a good thing that I suggest watching that video. Okay. Revelings and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's talking about the spiritual kingdom. You kept wondering, well, why does he keep saying that? Why does he keep saying that? That it's going to get in the way of your walk with the Lord and fellowship with the brethren. Why does he keep saying that? That's why. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes again. That's why. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It the kingdom of God is fellowship with God. Spiritual fellowship with God. It's going to affect your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And in doing so, it's going to wreck your uh, spiritual relationship with the brethren. Fellowship. If you're a man in ministry, it's going to really hurt your ability to use script, uh, Scripture. Galatians 2.20 reads, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And if the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and, have, and gave himself for me. But the life I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the life we're supposed to be living. Okay? Not by the flesh. The flesh is going to mess you up and it's going to hinder you inheriting the kingdom of God. It's the number one reason people don't get saved. Romans 8.13 reads, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. I'll go over that scripture again. And I'll use that as a million times when it comes to trying to tell people about that. We're not to live after the flesh. It's going to mess you up physically, and we just read there, spiritually. Romans 8.8 8 reads, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. What's going to hinder your walk with the Lord? Sin. It's not worth it, brothers and sisters of Christ. It's not worth it. Get that sin out of your life. If you fail the Lord, and you fall back into temptation, and you choose to sin... Deny yourself. Drop the pride. The haughty spirit, and if it's gotten so bad as pride, you definitely need to drop the pride and give up that sin. Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and get back to following Jesus Christ and serving Jesus Christ with the life that you're living. Okay. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You let these sins come back into your life, what happens? Your prayer life suffers. Someone asked me, well, it says here, if you call upon the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved. So if someone calls and they didn't repent, are they still going to be saved? Well, if you kept reading it, it says, how can they call on him whom they have not believed here? But for instruction in righteousness, when you start getting into sin and you start holding that sin, not struggling with it, when you have those brethren out there that I believe are saved, and they start holding on to sin, they're holding iniquity in their heart, God will not hear their prayers. A, they're not praying as much, and if they are still praying as much, God's not going to hear your prayers. Because you're holding iniquity in your heart. you got to let go. What did we just read there? They that which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, no, no, God will always hear your prayers. Not if you're holding iniquity in your heart. Philippians 4, 6 reads, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Oh, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. God, conviction says, get that sin out of your life. 
I ain't giving that sin out of my life. But Lord, help me. Everything's falling apart around me. I need help. But I ain't giving that sin out of my life. God's going to go like, well, I guess he's got to go through a lot more chastisement. I guess he's got to, I got to tear him down a peg or two a little bit more until he gets that sin out of his life. We're not talking about anything else until you get that sin out of your life. That's how God is. James 1.5 if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. How can you ask for wisdom if you're holding sin in your heart? I'm not talking about struggling with sin. I'm talking about holding sin in your heart. I ain't giving this up. I love my movies, TV shows, video games. Whatever. I know I'll get, I'll get hammered for this one, but holidays. I've known brethren that have forsaken fellowship because of holidays. Is it worth it? No. It's not worth it. Definitely not worth it. For Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How can they call on someone who they have not believed? If they didn't believe in here, and they're holding iniquity in their heart, talk about lost person, when they go to ask God to save him, he won't hear that prayer. Why? Because he looks at the heart. This book looks at the heart. Okay. Signs of walking in the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Now we're going to get, stay, we're still at Galatians 5, but get to 22. We just saw the flesh, but what's contrary to the flesh? Remember, Spirit. The Spirit warreth against the flesh. See, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Verse 17. Now we get up to 22. God just doesn't leave you hanging. He doesn't say, oh, that's all wrong. Okay, if I'm not supposed to do that, well, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Well, I ain't going to tell you. He tells us, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, I'm sorry, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against, against such there is no law. Okay. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's, people who are saved, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. That's the mark of someone who's saved, the changed life. You're going to start struggling with the flesh. The spirit and the flesh are going to be struggling one with another. And the spirit is supposed to come out on top. You see what we're talking about? Well, I fail the Lord. I get back into sin. You know the number one thing that makes a Christian miserable? It's not other people. I've said it before. It's not other people. It's sin. Sin comes into my life and makes me miserable. And the Holy Spirit is convicting me, convicting me, and gets me to get back to doing what's right for the Lord. And the Holy Spirit, when you're truly saved, in the end, is always going to win out. It's going to win out. That's why I, I did that teaching about carnal Christian. What about carnality? What about carnal Christians? No such thing. You look very carnal when you first get saved because it's like buying a house that's just completely trashed, and you open the front door, and everything is just completely trashed. Boxes of and bags of trash everywhere. There might be some good things that's keepable, but most of it's trash. That's the that's my life, brothers and Christ, when I got saved. And I'm sitting there at the front door looking at my life and going, Lord, where do you want to start? we got to start cleaning up, and I need your help, Lord. Where do you want to start? That's how it works. Okay, You crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, you know, there's that Paul again, doubting salvation. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That's evidence. It's a Bible condition. If we walk in the, uh, live in the Spirit, then we're going to walk in the Spirit. That's, that's the evidence that you're living in the Spirit, that your actions, walk is action. You're going to be walking in the Spirit. Verse 26, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. I try my best not to provoke one another. 
brother, sister, Christ, you need to do that too. But there's the signs of walking in the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love. What do we read over there for the flesh? Hate. Joy. Over here you have wrath. Okay? It's it basically, like I said, it's contrary one to another. Peace. Okay, wrath, peace. You have joy. Okay? You have uncleanness over there. You can't have joy when you have uncleanness and lasciviousness. Not true joy. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Goodness. I want to go over all this again. Faith. Faith. Brothers and sisters of Christ, do you trust the Lord? That He knows what He's doing? Do you, do you believe His book? When He said He'll watch over you and take care of you? Don't be worried about what's going on out in the world. Or how bad it's getting out there. Have faith in the Lord. He knows what He's doing. He's got the timing all set up when He's going to come back. And if it comes down to it, brother, sister Christ, that I have to be a martyr for Jesus Christ, God's got that taken care of too. I won't be alone. Right? Faith. Meekness. Lately, some of the brethren are getting really riled up. Oh, don't forget meekness. Temperance. The whole point of this is you read what the flesh is about and you read about what the Holy Spirit's about and they're contrary one to another. Which one are you following? You cannot follow both. I can't express this enough. You can't follow both. If you're following the flesh, you're not following the Spirit. If you're following the Spirit, praise the Lord, then you're not following the flesh. That's the whole point. Okay. And I want to end this with one little tidbit we're going to go through real quick. Because that, that's it, brothers and sisters Christ. What's going to destroy your walk with the Lord? Sin. Not destroy it, but what's going to basically damage it and bring it to a complete halt where you're not actually walking at all? Because we read there, if you live after the Spirit... Let us also walk after the Spirit. You know what's going to bring that walk of the, whole, of the Spirit to a halt with the Lord? is sin. How do you get it back, your life back on track? You take your eyes off the, the lust of the flesh and you put it back on Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. That's the solution. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You get your eyes back on Jesus Christ. But what happens when you're fellowshipping with brethren, present tense, indulging in the flesh, or having wronged the brethren? Why is this so important? I did a study, uh, I'll try to link the studies below, but I did a study about is sin justification to break fellowship? Yeah, it is. Okay, um, you two go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll read it. I, I, we can go a little bit longer. Please bear with me, brothers of Christ. If you have to break this in half and watch half the study and then the other half, fine. It's a long study. Fellowship with the brethren, present tense, including the flesh and having wronged the brethren. 1 Corinthians 5.1 It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles. What was one of the things we read there? The works of the flesh? Adultery and fornication. Basically sexual perversion. That one should have his father's wife, and ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned. Pride. Okay. That he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. That should be enough to say, okay, you got someone that's in wicked sin, they don't want to give it up, because it's talking about pride being puffed up. They're puffed up rather than mourning. The person who's doing this is puffed up. Pride, they're not denying themselves. What do you do? You put them out. <coughs> Verse 3 For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Remember, you put it out. Those that are without, God judgeth. And how do God judge sometimes? God judges sometimes by saying, Okay, Satan, you have permission to do such and such, 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 but don't kill him. 
you can do this, but don't kill him. Remember Job. He gave Satan permission to do things to him, but don't kill him. Now, Job didn't sin, but the same thing works today. You put him out of the fellowship. They can be, in other words, the world. Who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. That the Spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. That they won't lose a lot of rewards. You put them out, they completely refuse to give up that sin. It's because this sin is really bad. What does the Bible say? If you live after the flesh, you shall die. God will chastise them because they're out being, he's out of the fellowship and he's being chastised of the Lord. And he'll chastise to the point of killing them and bringing them home if that's what it takes. Verse 6. Your glory is not good. They're glorying in it. When you pass over, it talks about the verse about where he's warning you about people that are false converts. They're actually the enemies of Christ. It talks about whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame. People say, you always say he's doubting salvation in First and Second Corinthians. Look what he says there. Your glory is not good. Then he talks about how these false converts are glorying in their shame. Whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. They're lost. They're false converts. They're glorying in their shame. Okay? Their glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Brothers and sisters of Christ, there's times where you're going to have to kick people out of your lives. Saved and lost. Primarily lost. I pray you don't have to kick the saved people out of your life, but so, uh, out of your fellowship, you're going to have to kick some people out of your fellowship. Okay. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. If the guy is glorying in what he's doing here, fornication, then he's talking about it. You don't want to be around him. Matthew 18, 15 reads, this is when brethren wrong each other. Matthew 18, 15. The first one was about sin. This is about brethren that have wronged another brethren in Christ. Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. People don't like following this. Brethren, come to find out the ones that really didn't like following this were false converts. Okay? But brethren as a whole forget that we're supposed to follow this. If a brother has wronged you, you don't go crazy off on that brother. You don't go behind his back and start causing drama and um, backbiting and gossip and everything. You go and talk to that brother so you can gain your brother back. That's the whole point of this. This isn't to start a fight. This isn't to get into a debate. This isn't to make the man look bad or anything. It's so you can get your fellowship back with your brother because you love your brother in Christ. I've had brethren point out mistakes that I've made, and I've made mistakes. They pointed it out, and then they wanted nothing to do with me. I'm like, but I'm repenting. I'm trying to make them, I thought you came to me to tell me this because you love me, and you want our fellowship back, and I screwed up. I made the mistake. Nope. I'm just throwing you out. That's not what this is talking about. What did it read there? Uh, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. You got that fellowship back. People, like I said, today they're used, they, their brethren, they have people that say that they're desperate for fellowship, but then they look at any and every excuse to destroy that fellowship. It's, it's just, the Bible talks about the falling away. We're in tough, tough times. We're definitely in the end days. I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes. But if the brother shall hear thee and repent... I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. I shouldn't have said that. Please forgive me. You've gained your brother. Forgive him. Get back to your fellowship. Don't hold it on to a grudge, bitterness in your heart. Verse 17. And if he shall neglect to hear them, the two, the two to three witnesses, tell them to the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, 
Let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. You know what a heathen man is? It's another way of saying lost. You know, treat him as if he's lost. What did Paul say? You put him out of your fellowship. Brothers and Christ, your walk with the Lord is so important. And when you have somebody come in, saved or lost, that starts affecting your walk with the Lord, no, I'm not talking about a brother in Christ coming in and pointing out your sins. You're miserable and you're just trying to make me miserable. No, they're pointing out your sins. You're miserable because of your sins. And they're trying to come to you with love and grace and charity, trying to help you with that sin to get your walk with the Lord, to get their fel our fellowship back. Okay? You're miserable because of your sin. But you're going to have people, other than that situation, you're going to have people that come in that they're, they're, they're going to flaunt their sin in front of you to tempt you to get you to go to the right or to the left and not stay on that straight and narrow path that God puts you on. And you're going to have to say, sorry, I want this to be fruitful in my life. I don't want sin in my life. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. Goodbye. It's tough, lost, especially when it comes to lost family members. When I first got saved, a lot of my family members, when I used to hang out with a lot, I hardly spend time with them. I always bring this up because I spent a lot of time with my mom, movie buddy, watching Hollywood movies that were basically promoting and flaunting and glorifying a lot of that sin that we just read right there. When I got saved, God convicted my heart. I didn't want anything to do with movies. My flesh still does, but my soul, my heart, wants Jesus Christ. We don't hang out that much. The moment, the day, what really did it for me was the day that she actually stood up to me and told me, I don't want to hear anything about the Bible or religious things or Jesus Christ from you. She's a professing Christian, and when I try to tell her the Bible version issue, she wants nothing to do with it. When I try to tell her about the real Jesus Christ, when I tell her why I'm not doing those, things, those sins anymore, because I'm saved and God is cleaning up my life, she doesn't want to hear it anymore. And ever since then, we hardly talk. She keeps trying to come out and starts quoting movies and stuff like that to tempt me. I don't want that temptation. Oops. I just hit this and it fell down. Ugh. But um, my younger brother, he's a hardcore video gamer. I'm the one that got him into video games. Right now, I don't invite him to come stay with me because I know he's a hardcore video gamer, movie and TV show. That's, this, that's temptation that I don't need and don't want. He wants nothing to do with Jesus Christ. The real Jesus Christ of Scripture. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you let sin back in your life. One of the ways you can let sin back in your life is you let somebody back into your life that promotes that sin and glorifies that sin and flaunts that sin in front of you. And it's going to, don't think, oh, it's not going to affect my walk with the Lord. Yes, it will. It's not going to affect my fellowship with the brethren. Yes, it will. Oh, it's not going to affect my usefulness in the ministry. Yes, it will. And these last days, we're going to be like, I, I keep pointing this out to the brethren. If you start feeling uh, loneliness, go watch that study about, does uh, the Brother Brian did about, um, does John prophesy isolation? You know, John, who was uh, exiled to the island of Patmos. Okay. In these last days, as more and more Christians that are saved are falling away, and more and more false converts are being brought to light, I mean, they're just, they're just, it's, it's like having these light bulbs that trying to, they look like us, but the light bulbs are going out, left and right. There's, there's, there was a thousand light bulbs, now there's like 22. The lights are going out. We're realizing there's a lot of false converts. There's lights, but they're not out, but they used to be super bright, but then there's also these lights that are just really dim. Just really dim, barely on. What is that? That's a Christian that's fallen away. 
Jesus is in them, they have the Holy Spirit, but they've fallen away, and that light isn't shining. There's very few of us, brothers and sisters of Christ, you're going to have to live with isolation. So, I'm going to leave you guys with Luke 9.23, when it comes to sin. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Fighting sin, putting down the flesh, is a day-to-day -day fight. Picking up that cross daily. Denying yourself. If you have to pick up your cross daily, that means you're denying yourself daily. you got to put down your flesh every day. I get so tempted all the time to go back to movies, TV shows, video games. I get tempted when I go into town by a lot of the immodest dress women because of my past and poisoning my brain with so much sin. That's why the Bible is so hardcore about abstaining from all appearance of evil. Okay. I get tempted every day. And every day I, read the, I start my day with the Word of God. I end my day with the Word of God. I sing hymns. I do Bible studies. I talk with the Lord almost all day about anything and everything. Why? Because it keeps my eyes on Jesus Christ and off this flesh, this body of flesh. It helps me keep my eyes on Jesus Christ and off this wicked and perverse generation. <laughs> This wicked world, it helps remind me to deny myself every day, pick up my cross every day, and follow Jesus Christ through His Word. So, I'm going to wrap this up. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm praying for you when it comes to cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lusts of other things. Those are the three things that will bring you down and destroy your walk with the Lord. Destroy, not destroy, I use the word destroy, but it will really hinder. It will bring your walk with the Lord to a halt. It will, however, destroy fellowship with some of the brethren. If not all. Okay? It can destroy a ministry. If you're a young man or an old man in ministry. It will hurt your ministry and it can destroy your ministry. Those three things. Please, please heed the warning that God's given to stay away from those things. Don't get uh, carried away with the world and what's going on in the world, the cares of this world. Trust the Lord. Deceitfulness of riches. Learn to be content with whatever state you're in. Lust of the flesh. Remember to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit of the lo of is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. Living for Jesus every day. Putting the flesh down every day. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I'll quote that because it's a big verse for me. When I start putting God's word here, not here, here, and living it and applying it to my life, that's when my life got easier as a Christian. When I was newly saved, I had a lot up here, and God was trying to transfer, it's like a computer, trying to transfer it from here to here. Because I had done a lot of studying, Bible version issue, the major doctrines, instruction, I did a lot of study before God saved me, and said, okay, enough's enough. Do you believe this book? Do you believe this is God's perfect written word? Yes, I do. Then, do you believe the plan of salvation that's in here? Yes, I do, Lord. And yes, I'm just a wit That's when I looked at my life. You're right, Lord. I need to repent and believe in you. Enough head knowledge. It needs to make it down here. You want to fight sin? Stay in the Word of God and obeying the Word of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes being spiritually, walking in the Spirit. Keep doing things that are godly. Work for the Lord. But the thing is, is prayer, Bible reading, Bible study. Learn to do things with your hands that are good things like gardening, woodworking. Okay? Uh, plants, indoor plants even. Okay? Cooking. Learning how to um, dry foods. Uh, canned foods. Learning how to eat healthy. Fishing, hunting. 
that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, being a mechanic or electrician or a plumber, physical things that will keep your eyes on things that are good. And when you're doing things, brother and sister Christ, talk to the Lord. He wants to hear from you. Talk to the Lord about what you're doing. Talk to the Lord about everything, especially in these last days. Talk to the Lord all day. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Well, you've got to sleep and you've got to eat. And I understand that. But that verse doesn't really kick in until these last days, looking at what's going on in the world, my struggles with the flesh. That praying without ceasing, it is not far, it's the truth. You want to stay focused on Jesus Christ, you need to pray without ceasing. From sun up to sundown, you need to be talking to the Lord about everything. Oh, you're going to do some cooking? Talk to the Lord about the food you're cooking. He might put something on your heart, or you've got something on your heart that you want to talk to Him about why you're cooking. It's not, it has nothing to do with your cooking. But you talk with the Lord about everything. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters Christ, it helps keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. My prayer life just starts to disappear when I start letting sin back into my life. I start becoming miserable and I lose my peace and I lose my joy. When I let sin back in my life, I start becoming miserable. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.